Hello everyone, dobar dan. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this workshop. And I'm really happy that they chose accessibility as the subject of this event and that accessibility has recently been getting more attention. Much of the credit goes to the international streaming services, especially Netflix, which has been launching subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, SDH, in more and more languages, including my language, Czech, and Apple TV, which has been offering SDH in a number of languages for several years, although this has largely gone unnoticed. Okay, SDH, International versus National Conventions. The interesting thing is that SDH conventions are more diverse across different nations than conventions in subtitles for hearing viewers. For example, Colored text is used differently in different countries. Unfortunately, international companies often seem to follow conventions that are different from the national conventions, and as a result of that, deaf viewers may become disappointed and discouraged from viewing a film or a series, and they may even decide to cancel their subscription. The gap is becoming even wider as more SDH is produced and as it is more and more often created by newcomers who aren't familiar with the local conventions and their viewers' needs and expectations. I would say that it is not only important but also enriching to follow the discussions of the deaf community about SDH and to meet the SDH users in person, for example at events where interpretation is provided. Now let me present a kind of case study. I'll take a look at the major differences between my country's SDH conventions and the SDH subtitling practice of international streaming companies. I believe that this kind of comparison and discussion can be beneficial for both ecosystems, the national and the international one. My wish is to spark a dialogue between them. Anyway, I'd like to emphasize that it's not my purpose to, crit to criticize the streaming services. On the contrary, they deserve praise for the pioneering work they do when it comes to accessibility. And Netflix has done a fantastic job when they wrote and published their style guides. For some languages, they have been the very first guidelines ever, or at least the very first published guidelines. Also, not all countries have their national subtitling guidelines, and even fewer countries have SDH guidelines. So, we can't really blame the international streaming services for not following the national conventions when the conventions have not been formally described. In my discussion, I'll also try to highlight potential obstacles that alignment of international practices with the national conventions could pose. Some of the differences may apply to more languages, some will be specific to Czech and perhaps Slovak SDH only. First of all, let me focus on line initial hyphens. Quite surprisingly, hyphens are used in Czech SDH to signal turns in the dialogue. A hyphen means that another person starts speaking. On the other hand, in Czech subtitles for hearing viewers, Hyphens are only used when there are two speakers speaking in the same subtitle. In other words, you always have either two or no hyphens in a subtitle for hearing viewers, while you can have either no hyphens, one hyphen or two hyphens in an SDH subtitle. Let's take a look at this example. It's an excerpt from a classic Czech film, Dinner for Adele. 
in the left hand column you can see SDH as you would see it on international streaming services. In the right hand column there's SDH following the Czech conventions. I didn't include a column with translation because we are only interested in the hyphens. As you can see, the Czech style subtitles either add or drop hyphens when compared with the international style subtitles. The very first subtitle starts with a hyphen because the character didn't speak in the previous subtitle, which you cannot see here, of course. On the contrary, in the third subtitle, the character continues speaking from the second subtitle, so there's no hyphen. But when speaker number two in yellow responds, there is a hyphen. In the last subtitle, there is a hyphen, although there's just one person speaking. Again, it's because this third speaker didn't speak in the previous subtitle. As the guru and pioneer of Czech SDH, Vera Strnadová says, for Czech deaf viewers, hyphens are more important than colors when it comes to identifying speakers. And I'm going to discuss colors later. But at the same time, I should say that it is not easy at all for subtitlers to switch between the two hyphen styles. Traditionally, it wasn't necessary to switch at all because SDH was the domain of specialists who rarely worked as translators. Moreover, many of them use software that makes the placement of hyphens quite easy. So, although the special use of hyphens is highly desirable for Czech deaf audiences, it would make life more difficult for the subtitlers who also work as authors of subtitles for hearing viewers, that is, as translators, if they don't have appropriate tools. Oh, and I forgot to mention that um, the Czech convention is not to insert a space after the hyphen. Text color. I've touched upon colors already. As I've mentioned, colors are used in many countries, although the conventions vary a lot. In some countries, colors are used to distinguish speakers. In others, they distinguish different types of information. For example, in France, white text is used for characters speaking on screen, yellow text for characters speaking off screen, red is used for sound effects, and so on and so forth. My country is one of those which use text colors to distinguish speakers. We use four, white, yellow, green, and cyan. Some other countries, or broadcasters in other countries, use more colors. For example, in Italy, the public TV Rai uses five colors on black underlay. In addition to the four I've mentioned, they use magenta and 10 more color combinations of text and underlay for non-human speakers such as animals in children programs. Using colors to distinguish speakers has a very important side effect. When you use colors, you don't have to use speaker IDs as often. This gives you more space for dialogue. Therefore, it, is, it isn't a trivial task to convert between colored subtitles and single color subtitles, because you often have to add or delete not only colors, but speaker IDs and some dialogue as well. Again, as with hyphens, it's quite a laborious task to assign colors unless it is facilitated by the software you use. Ideally, you should be able to import the dialogue list and the software should help you assign colors, depending on the number of subtitles per speaker. But let me say once again that in Czech subtitling, correct use of hyphens is more important than colors. When we talk about streaming services launching SDH, 
I can imagine a trial period where only single color subtitles are used in combination with correct hyphens and speaker IDs. And perhaps only high profile titles could come complete with full color SDH. After the initial period, however, all subtitles should get the full treatment. I've actually had clients asking me, if Netflix doesn't use colors, do we have to use them? Yes, um, it would be very unfortunate if the international practice undermined the good practices that people are used to. Unfortunately, this is happening. As the pandemic struck and everything went online, a film festival I work for found that the streaming technology they used didn't support coloured subtitles, so they started using just one colour. When the cinemas reopened, they never came back to the full treatment, to the full colour treatment, quoting the international streaming services as one of the reasons. Um, by the way, for a lot of cinema goers, this festival was the first encounter with SDH, and many of them said they loved the coloured subtitles because they made it easier to understand who was speaking. Maybe um, this is the right moment to say that the term SDH uh, subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing is perhaps a bit misleading. SDH can serve hearing viewers as well in noisy areas such as pubs and public transport or in silent areas such as waiting rooms. However, it shouldn't be so difficult for programmers to add color support. After all, as you can see in this screenshot, Apple TV has used colors in subtitles in the drama series Pachinko, although they aren't used to indicate the speakers. Here, yellow text is used for Korean dialogue and cyan for Japanese. In other words, it should be perfectly feasible to have colored subtitles on streaming services. The difference in reading speeds and minimum duration is the next difference. When you review available guidelines for different countries and companies, what attracts your attention as the most striking difference is the huge difference in reading speeds. They range roughly between 10 and 20 characters per second. The most common target speeds are either in the region of 10 to 12 characters per second, for instance in Finland, or 13 to 15 characters per second, for instance in Spain and the German-speaking countries. On the other hand, um, international streaming services commonly allow as much as 20 characters per second which is more than they allow in subtitles for hearing viewers. It should be less, not more. Why? Because for some of the SDH users, spoken and written language is a second language. Their first language is the sign language. So they tend to be slower readers. But that's only some of the SDH users. Typically, someone who wasn't born deaf but lost hearing after they'd acquired spoken language is perfectly fluent. Such viewers can be very fast readers and may demand subtitles that don't drop any information. In other words, the SDH users are uh, heterogeneous, uh, a heterogeneous group with different needs. It's difficult to strike a balance and apparently some countries or broadcasters favour the former group, others the latter. But 20 characters per second is really a lot. In fact, a device that makes it easier to reduce the speed is used in some countries. 
For instance, um, the Czech guidelines that are now being drafted specify that subtitles may linger for up to three seconds after the audio. In addition, if a speaker is off screen, the in time may be up to three seconds before the audio. Unfortunately, some style guides only permit half a second after the audio. By the way, many national guidelines permit more than that, even for subtitles for hearing viewers. Anyway, let me go back to the conflicting needs of the target group. It would uh, hardly be realistic to propose that two different subtitle files should be produced for slower readers on the one hand and for omission-averse, faster readers on the other. But I believe that this is something that deserves discussions with our viewers because we need to know as much about their needs as possible. We might also like to discuss the issue of lexical simplification. Do our viewers wish to learn new words or do they prefer wording that relies on the most common words? This might depend on factors such as the expected age of the viewers. In my country, I'm told that older viewers are more likely to have a more limited vocabulary because in the old days, schools for deaf people weren't as good as they are today. I should uh, mention the minimum duration of subtitles as well. While it may be okay to show a short subtitle just for a second or perhaps even less uh, for hearing viewers, deaf viewers need a bit more time, otherwise they may completely miss such short subtitles. Sounds and sound effects. While most style guides say that only plot pertinent sounds and sound effects should be announced, the definition of what is plot pertinent may vary a lot. Let me also mention that deaf viewers may find it offensive if we announce sounds that can be inferred from the image. Typically, laughing is subtitled redundantly. From the Czech point of view, English templates are cluttered with all types of laughs, groans, grunts, inhaling and exhaling. It's perfectly okay if they are required in English, but it would be wrong to demand that all of them should be retained in translation. Let me show you some examples of redundant sound effects. Sometimes it's hard to identify the culprit. Is it the style guide or the subtitler? First of all, laughter. In most cases, laughter can be inferred from the image. This is a classic example. The subtitle reads, laughing, laughing. This subtitle reads, exhales, although the character is breathing quite normally. The next area is soundtrack. Sounds and sound effects are closely related to music and soundtrack. While in some traditions soundtrack is subtitled, in some other traditions only relevant diegetic music is subtitled. Diegetic means that it can be heard by the characters. For instance, there's a radio playing or the character is at a disco. In my country we don't subtitle non-diegetic music. We don't subtitle soundtrack. So, if non-diegetic music is subtitled by some streaming services, it can be quite confusing for deaf viewers. This subtitle reads scary music or gloomy music, but the characters cannot hear any music. Therefore, the viewers might think the music is coming from the car stereo. This subtitle specifies exactly what song is playing, but it isn't playing in the scene. The characters cannot, cannot hear it. 
Although this may be appreciated by some SDH users, in particular the hard of hearing or late deafened, it's confusing for the congenitally deaf. And as such, it breaks the Czech SDH conventions. If we want to meet the needs of the two different groups, we should discuss the issue with them. Maybe we'd come to the conclusion that if diegetic and non-diegetic music is clearly distinguished, the congenitally deaf won't be confused and the late deafened and hard of hearing will appreciate the information. The last difference I'm going to mention is positioning of the subtitles. Deaf viewers are more likely than hearing viewers to miss a subtitle when it's not where they expect it, and that is at the bottom of the screen. We should ask, which one is the lesser evil? A missed subtitle or an obscured credit or newspaper headline? These are two subtitles that are just a few seconds apart. The first one is at the bottom, the second one is raised. The exposure time is quite short, so it's very likely that the second subtitle will be missed. Speaking of positioning, there's a very innovative approach to SDH that I've only seen on Netflix. Subtitles placed near the speakers, like this one. I have no idea how time-consuming it is to create this type of SDH when compared with coloured subtitles with uh, the Czech style hyphens, but um, I suspect it can be quite tricky, especially when the camera angle changes. That brings me to the conclusions. In my opinion, once a service is offered to a group with special needs, it's a good idea to align the parameters of the service with the expectations of the group. If subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing aren't in line with national conventions, investment into such subtitles may be problematic. However, national conventions haven't been described or published in all countries, and this is exactly what we need. The description may come in any form, uh, whether it's a ministerial regulation, as in Slovakia, a technical standard, as in Spain, a document published by a professional association, as in Finland, or a document released by the National Language Council. As long as the only guidelines are broadcasters' internal and confidential documents, we can hardly expect the country-specific rules to be followed by all the players on the market. There should be regular communication between the broadcasters and streaming services, their vendors, the subtitlers and their associations, and the deaf community. I don't think we should rely on surveys and uh, feedback forms because there may be language and cultural barriers. My discussions with deaf people in my country suggest that focus groups or other forms of personal encounters might be more effective than surveys. I'd like to encourage my fellow subtitlers to get in touch with deaf and hard of hearing people because they are the ones who can give us the most valuable feedback. Finally, if it turns out that SDH needs to meet certain requirements that make its production more difficult and time-consuming, subtitlers and QCS should be offered appropriate tools and adequate remuneration. That brings me to the end of my presentation. This is the list of films and shows I've used to illustrate my points. As copyright legislation requires, I've mentioned the authors of translations where relevant. However, translators don't necessarily have to be the authors of the SDH. And even if they were, it wouldn't be my intention to point a finger at anyone. 
Instead, I've tried to identify systemic issues that deserve our attention. Thank you for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have.